All right, guys, welcome to today's workshop. Um, today, we're kind of setting up your chemistry class for success. Um, coming to you from a very wet and soggy, gloomy Jackson, Mississippi. We've been dealing with Hurricane Barry here for the last two and a half days. Um, and so it's just been, we haven't gotten the worst of it. We've gotten pretty light rain. Um, I know people both east and west of us have gotten just downpours and downpours of rain. We're doing pretty good here, just a little bit of rain, but lots of clouds. Uh, we're supposed to see the sun tomorrow, which will be the first time since Friday, late afternoon that we've seen the sun. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing the sun here in a few days, and so or hopefully tomorrow. Um, so today, uh, we're doing this workshop on setting up your class for success. And if you haven't been going to the replay page, or you haven't registered in order to be able to get to the replay page, I encourage you to do that because that's got all the workshops that we've done so far. So I've already done five. This is number six, I believe. Um, could be number seven. Yeah, I think this is number seven, actually. And so this is number seven of our workshops. And then I'm going to go through the end of July. And then in August, I'm going to switch to Saturdays at this time. And I'm going to do four more in August. And so we're going to go all the way through to the end of August, right there before Labor Day. Um, and just once again, just trying to give you all information and give you resources to help you out, because uh, that's what I'm here for. And so um, I'm Jeff Anderton. Um, I'm the founder of Teaching High School Kim. And with that, I want to get started with today's workshop. All right, so like I said, my name is Jeff Anderton, and I grew up in Marietta, Georgia, which is a suburb of Atlanta. Uh, grew up there all my life, pretty much and went to Georgia Tech, got my degree in chemical engineering, uh, but decided yeah, engineering wasn't so much for me. Um, and so I had a number of people speak into my life and say I was good at teaching. And so I went back to school and got my education degree. So I literally did those back to back um, and then started teaching chemistry in 2001. And chemistry has always kind of been my love of all the sciences. I love sciences in general, but chemistry has always been my love and I've had a lot of people tell me that not only am I good at teaching, but I'm also good at teaching chemistry. Like it's, I do it in a different way. And so that's why last year um, I left teaching to start this business, to start teaching high school chem, to equip and help you. A uh, quick little side note, um, I want this to be an interactive workshop. So if you wanted to hit the chat button, feel free to ask me questions as I go along. I'll gladly try to pause and answer those questions as we go along. Because um, really, I want to, yeah, I want to answer your questions. I want you to leave feeling like you've gotten great value out of this and that it was worth your time. Because um, I honestly want, I think it's always worth your time to invest in yourselves. And that's kind of how I see this workshop. So with that, let's start into really where things start. And if you've been in, any of my other workshops, one of the things I like to do is I start off first with mindset. That whether you're trying to do pacing and planning, or whether you're trying to do helping students with weak math skills, or helping kids with reactions or stoichiometry, our mindset and how we approach it matters a great deal. So we're gonna look at expectations, and we're gonna look at three sets of expectations. Expectations for your course, your class, Second, we're going to look at kind of your expectations for your students. And then third, we're going to look at your expectations for yourself. So looking at the course, you know, if you saw my workshop on planning and pacing, I go into this in a lot more detail than I'm going to go into it today. Uh, this will kind of be the abbreviated version of this. But um, you got to ask this first question first. What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, what is the goal of your course? What is your expectation? Is it to get through the book? Is it to cover the standards? Um, if you try to do either of those, I feel that they have one major weakness, that both chemistry books and standards treat every topic as if they're of the same amount of importance, but also as if they're of the same amount of difficulty. Learning the periodic table is not nearly as difficult as doing electron configurations or stoichiometry. Um, and therefore shouldn't require as much time and we can't give them the same amount of time. We've got to make choices in my opinion. Um, and so I don't think that's the best idea. 
Um, I tend towards the second one, which is prepping students for what comes next. So, you know, if you are simply in a school where kids have to take this to graduate and they may or may not go to college, then maybe what comes next is just simply getting them to graduate. For most of you, you're going to be teaching kids that are in a college prep track who probably, I would say maybe about a third of your students are going to have to take chemistry at some point in time in college. Maybe higher percentage, depending on what type of school you're at. I would focus on that, on trying to prep your kids for walking into college chemistry. And then if you're at a class where you have AP chem, maybe you're working with that AP teacher and you're really working on what do you need to have them grounded in to be prepared to walk into AP. Um, so for me, that's what I do. Because for me, I focus on getting them prepped for a college class. And I'll get to that. I'll expand on that more in a moment. So, and then you also need to make a conscious decision about what's driving the bus. What is driving what you're doing? Is it, the, once again, is it the textbook? Is your goal to get through X number of chapters or get through the book? Is your goal to cover this much first semester, this, and, and that's what drives you to make your decisions? Or is it the standards that you know you've got to cover X, Y, and Z, and if you don't cover the standards, then you know, this or might happen or that might happen? Or are you deciding what's most important for your students? Allowing the textbook and the standards to, to have a voice in the matter, to be important, but to not make the decisions for you. That you take ownership of your class, that you take um, the range of your class to say, all right, I know my standards say I need to talk about equilibrium, but I'm running out of time. It's the end of the second semester. I'm going to take equilibrium and I'm going to throw it together with solutions and we're going to do a super, super fast, you know, you know, overlook of it. And I'm just going to cover the basic basics and get through it. That's an acceptable answer. You know, if you have the time, go into the detail, go into great detail, all that's in the book. But if you don't, then you need to pick and choose where you're going to spend your time. Um, and I really feel like you have to do this at the beginning of the year. You have to decide what you're trying to do. You have to decide how you're going to do it. And so you have to decide where you're going to focus your time. And for me, a giant chunk of my schedule, I focus on what I call the big three. And let me show you what I mean by that. Here's the big three. The big three for me is nomenclature, reactions, and stoichiometry. And in stoichiometry, that's conversions, moles, and stoichiometry, all kind of jammed in that one topic. So for me, this is, this is the crux of my year. This is where all my emphasis goes, or a lot of my emphasis. Because, like I said, I'm trying to prepare my kids to go into a college chem class. And for them to go into a college chem class, they need to be a really grounded in these three. And the reason being is a lot of college chemistry class teachers will cover these three in the first week and a half and then move on and expecting kids to know them. Um, and it's just, I've tutored enough college chemistry people and I've seen it enough times that it's just brutal that if they're not prepared with nomenclature, reactions, and stoichiometry. If they can't name things, if they can't balance reactions, if they can't do basic stoichiometry calculations, they're up the creek. Um, and their teacher's gonna be going so fast that they're not gonna get much out of it. And if they go to a big school, the TA is gonna be more worried about his research than helping them. And so they kind of get lost. And so this is a major emphasis for me. So this is probably out of the four quarters of my year, a quarter and a half, 12 weeks plus, I spend doing just these three. I go slow, I go, I make sure the kids are getting it, and we'll kind of get to that more in a second, but I really focus on those. And so these ones, and in atomic theory includes quantum theory, and so these three kind of lead into it. They lay the foundation. Hey, things are made out of atoms, and there's this energy stuff. And then, hey, here's what atoms are like, and here's quantum theory that shows you what they're really like in the confusing way. And then here's the periodic table and the trends. And, and so I go through them, but 
because I'm focusing on these three, I really focus on not losing myself in these. There are cool activities, there's cool demos, there's cool projects. There's a lot of amazing, cool things you can do with those chapters. But if I spend too much of my time there, I'm not going to get where I need to go. Um, I don't know how much you interact with like people who teach U.S. history. You know, this is one of the things I think they run into. It's like a lot of them get so excited about colonial America and the revolution that they, they barely get to the Civil War by the end of the year. And it's kind of like a lot's happened in America since the Civil War. You know, or maybe they get to like the industrial, I mean, they get to like the ni early 1900s. And like they don't get to World War I, World War II, Vietnam, McCarthyism, uh, the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Bar Berlin Wall. I mean, all these things, they don't get to them because they spent too much time here. And so you've got to decide where you're going to focus and then make your choices accordingly. So like I said, I cover these, I do some fun activities in them, but I really try to make it pretty much hey, these are foundational pieces. We're going to get through this so we can spend our time here. And then kind of the same thing happens here on the back side, that these get covered with whatever time I have left. Um, and if I don't have as much time, then they get a little bit briefer, quicker um, teaching of them. If I have more time, then I slow down. I will do more. And even within these, I pick and choose. Um, like to me, kinetic molecular theory and states of matter is more important than reaction kinetics. Um, really, reaction kinetics, depending upon your standards, you may not even need to cover. Um, equilibrium, once again, to me, that's something that just needs to be introduced. They don't need to be doing ice diagrams, if you know what those are. Um, and so once again, I make my choice that this is where I'm spending my time. And then I kind of basically prioritize everything else after that and make sure that's what I have, All right? So that's course expectations. What's your focus? What are you trying to get your kids prepared for? It's critical. You need to take a step back and really think about what you want for your class. Where do you want your class to be at at the end of the year? All right, which brings us to your expectations on your students. Okay, this isn't their expectations of class, this is your expectations on them. Um, first thing, chemistry is rough. Um, it is probably the hardest science for most of them they're going to take their entire career. I mean, physics, if they take physics, physics is hard. I mean, physics is a lot of math and it can be hard, but it's so much more concrete than chemistry. Chemistry is so abstract, you can't see atoms and molecules, you can't see bonds. Unless you use a modeling kit, like there's so many things, but quantum mechanics just messes with people's heads. And it's hard, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, and so I'm a big fan of what I call student driven pacing. And here's my illustration one of my guilty pleasures is I like watching baking shows. Uh, my six year old son, he'll be like, Daddy, please don't watch a baking show. I'm like, Sorry, buddy, my turn to watch TV. Um, and I love watching baking shows. And I love watching all sorts of cooking shows. But when it comes to a baking show, you'll see somebody try to make a cake like this. And, you know, in a baking show, they're under time constraints. They're rushing. And if they don't prioritize their time correctly, and they don't really do things in the correct order the right way, problems are going to happen. You know, if you rush the cake, it could be raw in the middle and not cooked all the way through. If you try to ice a cake while it's still warm, that icing is going to melt and the layers are going to start slipping and sliding everywhere. If you don't do what's called a crumb coat, uh, you're not going to get this nice, smooth outer coating, you know, and then you got to do this right. And there are so many steps and they have to be done in the right way, but they also have to be done in the right amount of time. And you can't move on until you finish the previous stage. You can't ice it until it's cooked. Okay, or until it's cooled. And you can't let it cool until it's cooked all the way. And then you can't do your crumb coat until you, you know, all those kind of things. And so it's the same way with pacing a class. Once again, I, I spent a lot more time on this in the first workshop on pacing and planning. But um, the key here in my mind is you never move on until your students get it. That would be the general gist of it. That 
you know, when I'm teaching nomenclature, I don't move on to ionic nomenclature until my kids get covalent. And then when I'm in ionic, I don't move to polyatomics until my kids understand basic metal nonmetals, basic binary ionics. I want them to get that first. And, and then I don't move on. And then I'm, you know, when, once I understand polyatomic ions, then I add transition metals. And then once I add transition metals, I add, you know, differentiating between ionic and covalent and putting it all together. And so I really try to slow it down and let my students' understanding drive my pacing. Because this is hard. It's going to take them more time than I think it should. Um, now, this is not, and let me say what this is not. This is not let your students be lazy and let them determine how you do your class. No. This is be aware and push. I'm all for pushing my students. My class is not easy. But if you do what I expect of you, I'm not going to leave you behind. Um, and so I'm going to push them, but I'm not going to push them any faster than they can go. Okay? I'm going to push them, and I'm going to ex have expectations of them, but I'm not going to move on to the next chapter until I feel like they're, they're good with this one. And I'm not going to have some artificial deadline in my head that, you know what, this nomenclature chapter should take me two weeks. So I'm gonna, it's going to be exactly two weeks. We're going to test on this day no matter where they are. No, I'm not going to do that. Because for me, I'm going to be like, all right, y'all, this should be about two weeks. And I may even throw out a test date on there. It's like, but I'll be like, all right, guys, um, I really don't feel like you're quite ready yet. We're going to take an extra day or two, and we're going to make sure we get this before we do the test. And so I'll push it back. But once again, I'm doing it not because they're being lazy or they're manipulating me, but because I'm assessing where they are. And I'm assessing, where, are they ready to move on? And I'm not moving on until they're ready. Okay? So, the next big thing is teaching learning chemistry is like trying to eat an elephant. For those of you, if you've been teaching chemistry for a while, it's sometimes easy to forget this aspect. For us, it's become relatively simple. But for our kids, it's hard. Um, and so it's our job to break things down into bite-sized pieces. Okay, Because how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well. We need to give them the right bites, and we need to give them the right bites in the right order. Um, kind of like I just said earlier, like when I do ionic nomenclature, I teach um, binary, a metal and a nonmetal. I do that first, and I make sure they know how to do it. Then I add polyatomic ions, and we do those. Then I add transition metals, and we do those. And so I break it into pieces. But then at the end, I do my review sheet, which is really it serves a couple of purposes one i'm once again i'm doing student driven pacing i'm i'm trying to review it again one more time and assess where they're at before the test and see where any weaknesses are that i need to address in the last day but i'm also doing this i'm doing this last thing here to me my review sheet is where i help them to pull all the pieces back together again and hopefully i've been doing this as we've been going along teaching but the review sheet's one place that is designed to do that it's like Hey, take all the stuff that we started two weeks ago and let's put it all together at one time. And then that really helps them. And I'm a big fan of review sheets before test. I'm a big fan of telling or letting kids know, hey, here's my expectations. This is what you got to know. Um, you know, I don't think any student will ever tell you that one of my tests was easy. But my students will tell you that my tests are fair that they know what's coming, they've got to study, and they've got to prepare, and if they do that, they'll be fine. If they don't, they're up a creek. Um, but that's part of my expectations on them. It's like, hey, I'm going to give you clear expectations. Here's what I'm expecting of you, um, and so on. So, all right, and then the last thing we need to do in terms of having expectations of our students is this. What weaknesses are they coming into your class with? You know, it'd be unreasonable to expect this woman to go out and run a 5K in some reasonable amount of time. Um, that's not a reasonable expectation. And so we need to look at what are their, what are their, what's holding them back? 
Um, and what do you do with, you know, getting them where they need to go? All right. So Jana asked, how do I do it when I still have a third needing help? Um, there comes a point where, so if you're not in the chat, so Jana's asked, how do you handle that more than half the class gets it, but you still have about a third needing help? A lot of this comes down to me in terms of their willingness to work. Um, it could be one of these things that unfortunately that child is going to be a B or a C student and that's where they're going to be. Um, and that's who they are and that's where they are and how far can I get them? Um, I also, you know, there are times where I pull a kid aside and said, Hey, um, you need to be here in the morning. You need to come in for some extra help. Um, I'm definitely doing that. Cause yeah, cause I'm not going to hold back an entire class over just a few who aren't getting it as quickly, but I will give them every resource I can. I'll be there early. I'll, I'll help them during study halls. I'll help them after school. Um, I'm going to invite them however they can. Um, but the biggest thing there for me is they have to be willing. Um, a student who is not willing to put in the extra effort to get it, at that point in time, I've done everything I can and it's on them. Um, once again, that's part of my expectations that I put on them. It's like, hey, I'm going to give you all the resources you need, but it's your job to take those resources and use them. Um, and if they don't want to use them, that's on them. Um, and if they, you know, and that's why when I've had kids who have failed my class, I've been able to put an F on that final report card without regret because I know that I did everything possible to help them. Right. Um, but I've got some other tools that will help with that other third here in a minute as we get to that. All right, so that's expectations for your students. Now, expectations on yourself. Um, if you've been to any of my other workshops, this is something I use to describe what I think it looks like to grow as a teacher, is that if you're not doing anything, now you're just gonna grow nowhere. Um, and there are teachers who spend their careers photocopying handouts, teaching from slides from the books publisher, and really never grow in the art of teaching. Um, and I don't think that's any of y'all because you're here. Um, and so then you kind of move up. And so first thing you have to do is grow in content. So for example, um, about three years ago, I had the first opportunity to, it was four years ago now, first opportunity to teach robotics and coding uh, as part of a class. And I was really overwhelmed by the idea of teaching robotics and coding. And so the first thing I had to do is I had to learn it. I had to take the robot kit home, look at the instruction booklets and build it myself. Um, I had to go through the coding lessons and go through them myself. Um, because until I was really comfortable with the content, until I knew that robot forwards and backwards, until I knew how to do every one of those coding problems that they had, there was no way I was gonna be able to communicate. Because if I didn't understand it myself, then how can I communicate it to my students? And that communication, so like the first year was mostly this. I'm growing in content. I'm learning how to do this. I'm a little bit ahead of them, but not a whole lot. Um, but the second year I taught robots and coding, I was definitely much more here. I was really comfortable with the content, but I was really able to grow in my ability to explain it and communicate it to my students. And then by the time I got to year three, I was able to be a lot more creative with it because I was no longer stressing about learning the content. I was no longer stressing about how am I going to communicate the content. And because I'm not stressing about those things, all of a sudden my mind is freed up to be creative. And those creative juices can start flowing. And I started doing, like they had to do a maze that they had to do with a robot and code their robots to make it work. And I rearranged how I had things organized in the unit to to make it flow a little bit differently. And I was really able to be creative with it and go to another level. And so you need to know where you are on the spectrum. Are you growing in your content right now? Are you kind of weak in your content knowledge of chemistry? You no, know, is this your, you know, you're a biology person 
or you're a physics person or whatever, and chemistry is just not your thing, but they're asking you to teach chemistry this year. I know that happens, and it happens a lot. So perhaps you're here. You're trying to grow your content. You're trying to make sure you understand chemistry so that you can do it. Or are you really comfortable with chemistry, like I was? You know, I had a chemical engineering degree, and then I had a degree in science, secondary science education with a focus on chemistry. I was comfortable with it. But my first couple of years of teaching, I was here. I was really working on, all right, how do I take this and explain it to my students in a way that they can get, um, in a way that I can really help that extra third that's struggling um, and helping them get it. Um, and by the way, Janet, if you only have a third that's struggling, you're doing really well. Um, I think a lot of people have about a third get it and two thirds are struggling. Um, but you know, and then, you know, I've been able to be here for a while, growing in creativity, be able to tweak things and change things. So you need to know where you are. And the reason why is this. Think about the expectations you would have going into a job of a kid, a teenager, or an adult. You would have different expectations of what they're able to do and not do. You know, I don't expect a third grader to act anywhere like an adult. I don't expect, an, but I don't expect an adult to like have temper tantrums because he's tired, like I expect this one to. Um, teenagers are a whole nother boat, you know. They're going to be, you know, they, they think they're adults, but they still tend to act like kids sometimes, and they, you know, they got all this going on, and you've got to deal with them, but you have different expectations for them. So in the same way, I feel like as a teacher, you got to be the same way. If you are here, if you, your focus this year coming up is going to be learning the content and knowing the content, then you got to be gracious with yourself knowing that your communication is not going to be necessarily where you want it to be. And that's okay. You can't compare yourself to the teacher down the hall who's been teaching chemistry for 10 years. Or you can't compare yourself to me or anybody other teachers you know, you know or some other subject teacher or how you are in biology. If you've been teaching biology for 20 years and you're teaching chemistry now for the first time or second time, you're not going to be able to communicate it as well. You're going to have students who are struggling and you're just not going to necessarily know how to explain it to them to help them not struggle anymore. And as hard as that is on us as teachers, that's just reality. And the more gracious you can be with yourself about that, the better off you'll be because I mean seriously if you are here be gracious with yourself it is chemistry is a hard subject to know it's a hard subject to teach it's a hard subject to explain and if you're growing here then don't judge yourself by these standards you know if you're kind of like once again like the kid don't judge yourself by the adult or the teenage standards if you're kind of in this middle level, don't judge yourself by somebody who's been doing it for 20 years. Where are you? Where are you learning? Where are you, you know, and so kind of, once again, that's kind of take a step back and think about what you need to do for you this year. Because the, the one thing that's going to make you more frustrated than anything is having a standard for yourself that's not realistic. You know, I remember sitting with one of my mentors and I was just beating myself up about something and he just, stared at me and he was like, Jeff, what are you doing? Why do you think you should be able to do that? And I'm like, um, cause I thought so. He's like, no dude, like that's, that's, that's not something that's even actually possible for anybody. So stop beating yourself up and just, and, and go this way. And I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, and it was so freeing for him to say, Hey, don't have this impossible expectation on yourself. You know, so you're going to have kids that struggle, and you may or may not be able to explain things to them depending upon where you are. So judge yourself accurately for where you are, and then be gracious on yourself. All right. Next thing you need to do in terms of just kind of expectations for yourself or what resources do you have. And by that, I mean lab resources, supplies, budget. So I had a number of years in my teaching career where I was at a small private school. And my chem lab was a Sunday school room in a church. I didn't have burners. 
I didn't have lab tables. I didn't have a hood. I had to use bottle eye wash. You know, I have an eye wash bottle, which are not great, but they're better than nothing. And like, I'm literally like washing out my chemicals in the bathroom sink. That really limits what I can do. <laughs> you know, the amount of labs I was able to do, what chemicals I was allowed to use were severely limited because of just the resources I had. Um, and so you make do with that kind of thing. Um, once again, don't beat yourself up if you don't have, you know, I couldn't run a lab like I had at another school because I didn't have that lab space. I didn't have that lab budget. You know, the school I've been at most recently, I mean, man, I got paid there to be a teacher when I was getting paid to be an administrator at my small school. You know, their budget was so much bigger and it's kind of like, hey, I want to try this. They're like, okay, go order it. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah. Like, All right. Um, and that was so strange to me, but it let me be creative in different ways. Um, and then this last one's huge. Um, the support of your admin administrators and the support of your parents, that makes all the difference. If you know that you're, you've are you got a good administrator who's going to be gracious with you and just encourage you to grow, ooh, that frees you up. You know, you just, you don't have to have those like crazy expectations. Um, but if you got that administrator who's a micromanaging kind of OCD person and it's going to hold you to the letter of the law or the standards, then that affects things. And you've got to ch change your expectations for yourself and for your class accordingly. And so keep those things in mind. All right. Consistency. To me, this is one of the ways that I help my weak kids. Um, students do well when they know what is coming. If I gave you some puzzle pieces and I asked you to finish building this, you could do it because you can see the pattern, you see what's happening, and you could take care of it. So in the same way, I think our students need that. They need patterns. And so what does that look like? First of all, instruction equals assessment. And here's what I mean by that. The way you explain it in your lecture needs to look like how it looks like on the homework. Like the phrasing, how you're asking it, how you're saying it needs to look the same. And then how it looks on the homework is how it needs to look on quizzes. It needs to be worded exactly the same. You know, try to word your limiting reactants or your percent yield questions the same way or similar ways. Or if you're gonna use a bunch of different ways, then make sure you include all of them in your lecture um, so that kids can learn them and be familiar with them. And then that way it looks the same way on the test and then it looks the same way on the semester exam. And so if you're trying to use a book and use book resources, now let's say you're writing your own homework assignments but then you're using the, the textbook publisher's test. Well, then your homework assignments need to be written in such a way to match that test and how they're worded. Um, for me, this came out, um, my first year of teaching, I realized that I needed to have multiple choice questions on my semester exam just to give me a chance to get it graded in time. And so I had to go back and change how I was doing my test. Because at first, I wasn't doing multiple choice questions on my test. Um, but then I started doing it because I'm like, hey, I need to prepare my students for the semester exam, so I need to be giving them multiple choice questions on the test. And then I started doing that with quizzes. You know, I'd give them some multiple choice questions on the quizzes. Once again, just trying to prepare them and be consistent so they know what's coming. Um, and then clear expectations. Like I said, I'm all about, my kids know what's coming. Hey, on this test, you need to know how to do, this, you know, do limiting reactants, percent yields, and then tell me what the excess reactant is, um, and those kind of things. And like, I'll let them know, and we work through practice problems. You know, especially on the skill-based parts of chemistry, this is easy because you can give them exact you know, types of problems you're gonna give them on the test and then you just change the chemicals and the numbers on the test and you, know, you get to test them that way and it's relatively easy. But I'm all about clear expectations of what I want. Um, and once again, like I said, I like to push my kids. You know, I'm not gonna let them be all whiny and tell me they can't do something. I'm like, yeah, you can. Um, here, here's the standard, go meet it. Um, and if they don't meet it, then I need to assess, all right, was, was that them or was that me? If it's me, then we need to change something. Um, but we, I, I try to push them, but I try to be very clear of what I'm expecting of them so they can go get it. 
Um, kids don't like surprises because um, there's nothing like stress to kill focus and engagement. If a kid walks into a test and also that test doesn't look like what they've been doing in class, they're going to start stressing out. And when they start stressing out, I mean, if you, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but literally the prefrontal cortex, the front part of the brain, the decision-making part of the brain starts shutting down because you're entering into fight or flight mode. And, and so literally the ability to focus, to engage, to think critically decreases when they are stressed. And so I try to make it as smooth and comfortable a process as possible. They still have to learn it, but I'm trying to make it as consistent and smooth as possible. All right. Um, and then also consistency allows me to emphasize what I think is most important. So for example, for me, um, I'm a big fan of significant figures because it's just not covered in a lot of other classes and it's something I want them to understand um, that the number of decimal places or number of digits you have in a number matters. And so when I teach significant figures, they have to give me exact, like exactly how many it's supposed to have. But after that, my rule is they have to get within one. So if an answer is supposed to have three significant figures and they give me two, three, or four significant figures, then they're good. Otherwise, I count it off. Um, and we'll look at how I do grading in a moment, too. And I really try to be consistent with grading as well. Um, so that's important for kids to kind of know what's being counted off and why. Because um, kids get stressed out and you get in arguments with kids over grading all the time, I'm sure. All right, here's another big thing. So just to, this is not a common idea out there, and so I'm gonna push on this just because I think it, it is incredibly helpful. That I do not lecture, I'm very rarely do I lecture bell to bell. Um, I almost always stop short and then we practice. Um, and I don't spend a whole lot of time going over homework. And here's the reason why. I think that teachers can get into what I call the homework cycle. So you teach till the end of class, you give your kids homework, they go home, and when they're at home, you know, a third of your kids did it right, a third of them did it and did it wrong, and then a third of them kind of sort of tried, maybe. Um, and then you, they come back in the next day, they don't understand it, so you have to spend half the period going over the homework or reteaching it, or you're going to collect the homework and take it home and write comments on it and give them feedback and give it back to them, and they may read it or they may not. Um, and I just don't like that. Um, I don't like the fact that sometimes they go home and they practice it wrong, and then I have to unteach what they did so that I can reteach the right way. And so here's what this looks like for me. I, this, is, this works best for skill-based lessons, like nomenclature, reactions, conversions, stoichiometry, moles, uh, electron configurations, um, heat calculations, calorimetry, things like that. Um, for factual-based lessons, like atomic history, I don't do this to this extreme. But when I'm doing a skill-based lesson, what I want to do is I want to lecture through about a half to two-thirds of the class period. Then I'm going to stop. And I'm going to give the kids a student, I mean, some type of classwork or some type of homework. Um, and so I'm trying to give them something to practice. Um, usually I try to do classwork. Um, like I said, if I'm doing something like atomic history, you know, which is kind of more just a bunch of facts, um, I may stop a little bit before class and give them the homework just to get them started on it because I not a big fan of kids having a lot of homework at home. I just don't think it gets done. Um, and then, so I do this classwork assignment and I'm walking around and actively helping them. I'm not sitting at my desk. You know, confession, every now and then I'm having a bad day and I'll sit at my desk, but that just doesn't work as well. Um, I really seek to get up and walk around and actively help them. I'm walking around, I'm checking on their work, I'm answering their questions, I'm assessing where they are. Um, and this will come back when we talk about grading, is here, you know, instead of having to take home a bunch of papers to grade to assess where they are, I'm assessing them in class. 
And so I'm walking around and assessing, excuse the crying one-year-old, my wife's dealing with that. Um, but I walk around and I assess them. And then, you know, while I'm walking around, I want to do these things. Um, if I'm seeing multiple kids making the same mistake, I'm going to stop them. And I'm going to go back up to the board and I'm going to reteach through that mistake and make sure they understand it. But this is the great time to check in on my quiet kids who don't talk in class and don't ask questions. It's a great time to check in on my weak kids. And I am all for allowing peer tutoring. Now, to be honest with you, this method takes training. <laughs> it takes the kids some time to learn how to do this um, and to do it well, um, to learn that they need to be on task, they can't go out and work for another class. Uh, learning that when I say peer tutoring, I don't mean giving the other person the answer. I mean helping them understand how to get to the answer. That's what I mean. Um, and so I got to kind of coach my, my stronger students on, hey, here's how you do this peer tutoring thing. Um, I got to you know, get my quiet kids used to interacting with me one-on-one. -on -one. Even if they're not, they're not bold enough to necessarily talk in class, I want them to be comfortable enough with me one-on-one -on -one and knowing I'm with them, and then checking in on my weak kids. Or um, the one I run into the most is those kids who are kind of in the middle, who are used to getting it, but all of a sudden they're starting to struggle a little bit, and they start freaking out. You know, you have those kids, like they don't get the right answer the first time. They're like, oh, no, I'm going to fail. Oh, my gosh, life is horrible. <laughs> I just kind of laugh because I've, I've seen it too many times. Um, you know, then I'm like, all right, let's look at it. Let's go back. Oh, you just flipped this one part. See, that's it. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, just that one thing. You're good. You know, and I'm like, you know, and if I was grading it, it would be like this. And they're like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah. All right, let's try the next one. And they work on the next one. And they get that one perfectly right. And I'm like, see? They're like, great, thanks. You know, I can kind of, I can catch a lot of those problems up front and deal with them early on instead of, allowing them to fester and get bigger and a lot of times when i when i would get caught in that homework cycle i would just see that they're getting it wrong and i wouldn't be able to have those conversations with them about fixing it because that allows me to give them feedback one-on-one -on -one. it's almost individualized attention um and so and it's really helpful there you know and one thing you know, JJ talks about uh, walking around with her class roster and checking off who's getting it and who's not. You know, you can do something like that. And once again, you're, you're checking in on your weaker students. You're making sure you, it's a good time to try to get them some attention they need to get caught up. And you now you can't, you're only talking a half to a third of class. This isn't forever. Uh, this is not a whole lot of time. Um, and so you've got to kind of balance it out. Um, one of the things I have done when I do get the stoichiometry and like limiting reactants to present yields, that's complicated and it's hard <laughs> uh, for kids to grasp sometimes. And so sometimes I take an entire class period and instead of doing this, I just do this for the whole class period. Um, I give them some handouts and they work on them and I'm walking around and we're, then we kind of go over them and check the answers as we go along and we just spend the day practicing. Um, I don't lecture or anything. We just practiced and I'm walking around and helping them with that practice. And it really helps them get comfortable with it. And it can really be really helpful for your weak kids in that situation. All right. Which means brings me on to grading because to me, grading has got to balance my time, which is valuable, um, with the student need for feedback, which is valuable to them. And so, First and foremost, I do random grading. I don't grade everything. I don't have time to grade everything. Um, and so some things I grade, some things I don't. And they never know until they walk into class. So it kind of keeps them on their toes. The other thing I do is I randomize how I grade it. Sometimes I grade for completion. Sometimes I grade for accuracy. And a lot of that depends where we are in a, in a unit. Like if they're just starting off with a concept, you know, like we're just starting off learning conversions, then I just want to see that they, they attempted it. And that's more of a, you know, a completion grade. But if we're, you know, a couple of days into conversions, they should be getting these right by now, and I'm looking more for accuracy. 
Um, and some things like accuracy, like conversions, I can grade pretty quickly. I can literally walk around and grade a whole class's set of conversion problems in probably under 10 minutes. Um, and so I just have them be quiet while I walk around and check everybody's work. And I can literally write down a grade in my gradebook as I'm walking around. Um, but I randomize it. I mix it up. Um, just I don't have time to grade everything. And I don't have time to grade everything with comments on it. Because um, I really think written comments on work doesn't give them the feedback that we think it does. Because I don't think they read them. Um, and so I really try to get away from that. Um, I really seek to do what I call consistent grading. So I assign a point per step. So let me show you some examples of what that looks like. So for example, electron configurations. Um, what I usually do is for me, like if I ask them to do an, uh, a noble gas configuration, you know, did they get the right noble gas? And then to me, the, the final electron twice is most important. Do they realize that it was 4D and that was the ninth one over? Um, if you're not really sure what I'm saying here, I do have a workshop on strategies for teaching quantum mechanics um, that I really go into detail, more de detail on these types of things and why I kind of have it broken down. Because to me, really, it's the last place that's most important and everything else is off-ball principle and filling order. But like, so nomenclature. And this varies, once again, I vary this up depending upon where we are in the unit. So when I first start teaching covalent nomenclature, they get a point for the right uh, prefix, a point for the right element, right prefix, right element, right ending. And so they get five points. By the time we get to the end of covalent nomenclature, I'm probably saying one, two. You know, do they have the first part right? Do they have the second part right? And I literally, it then drops down to only being two point question. And so I vary this up um, depending upon where they are. You know, once again, when they're just learning how to do it, I break it into more pieces so that I can kind of reinforce what pieces are you getting right? Um, because that's, that's comforting to kids. Because when kids miss one small thing and the whole thing's counted wrong, they don't see the fact that they missed one small thing. What they see is that they got the whole thing wrong. Here, I'm like, hey, you know, they put tri here instead of die. You know, they did tri nitrogen pentaoxide. Then I only want to count off one point because they just missed one little prefix. The rest of it was right. And I want to reinforce what they're doing right. And that's kind of why I do this method. Uh, same thing here with writing a formula. You have the right calcium, you got hydroxide, and then you got the, the coat, the Subscripts, right. Um, for balancing reactions, same thing. Um, early on, I'll give them a point for each one of these that they get right. Later on, it goes down to just one point for balancing it correctly. And then conversions. Um, I went over this a little bit when I talked about my workshop on helping kids with weak math skills, but I'm going to hit it next week when I talk about strategies for teaching moles and stoichiometry. Why do I break it up this way? That given over one's a point, the number's in the right place is a point, the unit's in the right place is a point. And like I said, I'll discuss that in more detail next week in my strategies for stoichiometry unit uh, workshop that I'm doing next week. And then final numbers right and final unit there. And so that's kind of examples of what I mean. I'm consistent with how I grade something um, by doing it this way. The other thing I do to be consistent is when I'm grading a test, if I have five sections of chemistry, I'm going to wait until the last section's done before I start grading. And I'm gonna grade everybody's first page. Then I grade everybody's second page. And then I grade everybody's third page. The reason being is that I found that, I found that if I grade a whole classes first, that the way I did partial credit on first periods may not be the same way I did partial credit with fifth period. And so by doing everybody's first page at once, I'm much, I find myself being more consistent. Um, but it's just, you know, hopefully you've been teaching long enough, or if you haven't been teaching, you'll, you'll, you'll learn this. <laughs> that your mood affects how you grade, unfortunately. So like I know that like when I'm happy and I'm in a good mood, I tend to be a little more lenient with partial credit. And when I'm just mad and pissed, I tend to be stricter. 
Um, and so once again, I like to grade one page at a time so that my emotional mood is relatively close from beginning to end. And the other reason I do that is so I've got a big stack of papers. Once I flip the first page, I don't see the students' names. And unless they have distinctive handwriting, I don't know whose paper I'm grading page two, page three, page four of. And once again, that makes me more consistent. It removes any possible bias that I could accidentally bring into the situation um, that I don't want there. Um, and so that's another reason why I do that. All right, um, for me, white work. I don't know if your school has a policy. If you're allowed to set your own policy, I would recommend this one but you're free to do what you want to do. For me, it's 24 hours, and it's minus 10 points. Um, because I've learned, if I do not see that work within 24 hours, I'm not gonna see it. There's no point. Um, there's no point, I'm not gonna waste my time hunting it down. You know, these are, these are high schoolers. These kids are 16, 17 years old. Um, you may have some 15 year olds, depending upon how you teach chemistry at your school, but they're old enough to take responsibility. But I also want to give a late work policy because I want to be gracious because life happens. Things happen where you don't get things done at the right time. You got back from the basketball game at one o'clock in the morning and you didn't get to do any, you know, homework. It happens. I understand it. Something happens. You know, there are extenuating circumstances like, you know, a death in the family. I give more than 24 hours. You're out sick more than 24 hours. Um, but for just missing the work, is 24 hours. Um, same thing with quizzes. Um, I do a drop quiz, and if you're absent and you haven't taken your drop quiz yet, you just got your drop quiz. I'm not even gonna bother making it up. Unless you take the initiative to come to me and take it, I'm not gonna hunt you down for you to make up that quiz. It's just gonna be your drop grade. Um, and my kids know that, and they know, and you know, my really motivated kids who wanna replace a lower grade and they already have a low quiz, they're going to come in and make sure they make up that quiz on their time um, without me hunting them down. All right, just real quick closing out here on labs. Um, don't do labs just because it's cool. Um, labs are a pain in the butt to prep and clean up. They are time consuming. Um, once again, I, it's one of those things where I think other sciences just don't understand how time consuming doing labs is for chemistry as opposed to physics or biology. I really feel like our labs are much more time consuming. And so I want to make sure any lab I do, I'm doing on purpose for a reason to drive home a teaching point. With that in mind, I really like hands on activities. Um, I really like using these instead of labs when I can, if I have a good one because I find it more concrete. So for example, with Vesper, when I'm teaching my kids three-dimensional shapes with Vesper, I use candy and toothpicks. Um, setup is going by the store and buying candy and toothpicks and paper plates. Cleanup is putting it in the trash can at the end of the period or letting the kids eat it. Um, that's an easy prep right there. Um, I have another one that I use for ionic activities. Um, and so, where I use cards to help the kids see um, what goes with what. Um, you can go to um, teachinghighschoolchem.com slash resources to see those there. Uh, those are some, I've got some free samples up there, um, but really trying to look at ways to make very concrete for kids with hands-on, less time for setup and cleanup. Okay, I use demos a lot. Um, for the demo, I'm using a lot less of the chemical. It's a lot quicker to set up and it's a lot quicker to clean up. Um, and so I mix those up, but I do do labs. I want labs, but I'm gonna make sure that there's not a quicker, better way to do it with a demo or hands-on activity before I spend all that time getting that lab set up. But I want that lab to be worth it if I'm gonna go through that much effort. You know, like when you get to reactions, you gotta do a lab, you have to. There are so many cool reactions. Those kids need to see what's going on with a single displacement, and a double displacement, and a combination and decomposition. They need to see those things. Um, but you got to, you know, balance it out. Okay. Grading labs. Once again, this is making grading work for me and them. I give them two grades. I give them a classwork grade that is, you know, if you don't have classwork grade, it could be a homework grade. 
on how they behave and participate in lab. Then I give a separate grade for the write-up. And the reason why I do that is I found that, you know, I could kid have the kid who slacks off but has a good partner, and he gets a good grade on his write-up. And, and it just it would frustrate me. And so I added the second grade to kind of keep them um, honest, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it. And so that's what I've got there. Um, and so those grades are there. Right. Um, I also like to randomize partners. I change it every unit or chapter because um, I want them to learn how to work with other people. Um, they don't need to always work with their best friend. Um, they need to mix it up. And I, because you know, you're an adult, you've realized this, like you have to work with people you don't necessarily get along with. Um, and you got to teach them that skill. And so I randomize partners. All right. So the road forward, how can we help? So I've got my summer workshop series. Here's where we've gone so far. Uh, like I said, I've already done six. This is number seven. Uh, moving forward next week I'm doing, so if you are not already registered and have access to the replay page, um, then I would encourage you to do that. Um, go to teachinghighschoolkim.com slash workshops to register, and that'll give you access to the replay page where you can see all of these, okay? So I've done planning and pacing, helping weak math students, nomenclature, quantum mechanics, lab safety, and reactions. Oh, that's reactions, not T-actions. Um, next week, I'm doing moles of stoichiometry, and then I'm going to look at just some classroom management stuff on the 29th. And then the August ones, like I said, those move from Monday to Saturday, because some people will be back in school. So we're gonna look at student engagement on the third. For those of you who teach in a Christian school setting or a private school setting where your faith can come into play, um, that's part of my background. And so I wanted to do a special workshop on the 10th of how do you do that? How do you teach science in a Christian school setting or a private school setting um, in a way that your faith and the science are going together and integrated. Um, and so that's the tenth. I understand that doesn't apply to everybody. If you're teaching in a public school, you're welcome to come um, and hear what I have to say about that. But this is very specifically designed for a very smaller group of you as teachers. Um, then my second to last one is going to be just working with teens. Um, I rarely had a day that I didn't enjoy working with teenagers. I still enjoy teenagers. Um, it makes me a little odd maybe, but I think there are ways to interact with teenagers that make it more enjoyable. And I wanna kind of give you my tips on what that looks like there on the 17th. And then I'm gonna repeat this planning and pacing curriculum one here at the end of August. So I've got that and then I've got my crash course, which is for those of you who are growing in content, um, if that's where you are, this is, gives you everything you need to really, basically I teach you chemistry. Um, and then, but I'm also gonna give you office hours and mentor you and interact with you and help you with that as much as possible. And then I've got my monthly membership called the Academy. And this focuses more on the communication aspect. Um, I give you all the resources, but then really try to help you know how to communicate it to your students. Um, there's a lot more information at teachinghighschoolchem.com. But I want to close with this. What does it cost to not invest in yourself by, you know, because you can do this on your own. You can hunt down your own resources. You can do all that kind of stuff. But what would it cost you to not do a crash course or do the academy membership? Um, it's going to cost you time with your family and friends. Um, you're going to spend more time doing prep than if, if you let me help you. <laughs> You know, because I want to help you and I want to cut down on the time that you spend prepping and grading so that you have the freedom to spend time with your family and friends. Because the other thing that happens when we are stressed over how to communicate it or learning the content is we get distracted. I mean, this guy's looking at his computer. He's got, you know, girlfriend or wife, you know, trying to get his attention and he's just distracted. Have you ever been that way? Think about it. I mean, have you been out to dinner with your family and... You know, they're, they're all laughing and then you're kind of, and you're off in chemistry land thinking about, you know, the lesson tomorrow. Um, I want to give you the resources so you don't have to worry about those kind of things and you can be home when you're home. That when you're home, you're fully present with them. Um, and then also, I want to give you the resources so that you can take care of yourself. 
Um, I know for me, um, when I've been teaching exercise and diet, it's always been one of those things that um, is sure to go by the wayside um, when I don't do what I need to do. Um, and same thing with sleep. And so all those things are there to help you. And so like I said, so you just go to teachinghighschoolkim.com. You can see what resources we have for you to help you and to serve you and just to really help you be a better teacher um, and to save you these things, to give you more time with your family, to help you be more present when you are home, and to give you the ability to take care of yourself uh, by giving you the margin that you need. So with that, I look forward to seeing y'all uh, next week when we talk about moles and stoichiometry. Like I said, if you don't have access to the replays, just go to teachinghighschoolcam.com slash workshops. Register there. You'll get a link for the replays. Um, and all that will be up there for you. So with that, have a good week.